So um, when Richard asked me to present in this seminar, I had to do a lot of thinking about what in the world I could talk about that had to do with hospitality and the stranger. And I realized that actually <clears throat> I, there was a lot I could talk about because I'm a developmental psychologist, which means I study co how cognition develops in children. And there's a lot of work in developmental psychology that I believe relates to the question of the other. And so I thought, I just racked my brains for what I thought would be some of the most interesting claims and phenomena in developmental psychology about this problem. And I thought I would give you kind of a smorgasbord of these and then try to stitch it all together. So um, the title of my presentation is Making Sense of and Responding to the Other, What Does Developmental Psychology Have to Tell Us About How These Abilities Develop? And here are the different ingredients of my smorgasbord. I want to talk a bit about what Piaget had to say about <coughs> learning to separate self versus other starting from birth. Um, I want to talk about the problem of children's, I want to talk about how children experience difficulty in grasping other, the contents of other people's minds until about age four and how people with autism may never get this ability. I asked, uh, I gave you all a, a, an article that I'd written about metaphor and irony because I wanted to make the point in that article that understanding other minds is important for communication and I argue it's particularly important for non-literal communication and within that it's particularly important for irony. <clears throat> I want to talk a bit about some of the research of my graduate students because I think actually it all relates to the problem of the other, though I hadn't thought of it that way. Um, one student, Talia Goldstein, is looking at empathy and its relationship to training in theater. I have another student who's looking at reactions to art by the outsider and whether the outsider status of the artist affects our aesthetic judgment. And I have a third student who's looking at um, responses to animals and to digital objects <laughs> like robots and is asking whether we are treating those like outsiders or whether we're actually coming to see robots and computers as more and more like humans. And then I want to talk about some research that I had nothing to do but I th with, but I think it's very interesting. Um, some research in developmental psychology showing that as early as five months of age, babies are showing a preference for their own quote unquote kind. And then I want to try to stitch this all together. And in 20 minutes. Okay. So, um, Piaget. I don't know if people are familiar with Piaget or not, but I'm going to just assume people are not familiar. Um, <clears throat> for Piaget, the child was the center of the universe. The child does not differentiate between herself and the outside world. It's just one big fusion. And cognitive development for Piaget consists of progressive differentiation of the self from the other or the subject from the object. And I'll give you some examples of this in a minute. And <clears throat> Piaget calls this egocentrism, the idea that the self is fused with the outside world. It has nothing to do with selfishness. And development consists of gradually separating oneself from the outside world. And egocentrism takes different forms in different periods of development, particularly in infancy, in early childhood, not so much in middle childhood, and in adolescence. It takes three very different forms. So here's Piaget. And he calls this problem the problem of egocentrism. It's central to his theory. And it is a developmental achievement to outgrow egocentrism. So in infancy, the egocentrism of the infant is that the infant believes that objects are fused with him. He does not separate himself from objects. And when I say objects, I'm talking about objects like balls as well as objects like people. The infant does not differentiate self versus other. And one of the pieces of evidence for that is if an infant is reaching for an object, let's say this rattle, and you cover it up, the infant behaves as if the object no longer exists. You've probably all heard of the phenomenon of object permanence. The infant just looks away because the object has ceased to exist because he is no longer looking at it. So the object is no longer part of his looking action. 
So objects have no independent existence apart from the infant acting on them and looking include, acting includes looking. So at four months, when a mother leaves the room, what the baby will do is just stare at the last place he saw her, as if, Piaget said, as if to bring her back by staring, because her existence is part of his looking action. And so he's looking to bring her back. And there is no search for vanished objects at this age. The infant will not pull off a cover. If, you, if he's reaching for a rattle, you cover it up. That's it, he looks away. And it's astonishing, it's a very robust finding. So that's an example of egocentrism in infancy, where the child has not differentiated self from other objects. And the evidence for that is that when the object disappears, he thinks that it's really gone because he's no longer acting on it. In early childhood, say around four, <clears throat> egocentrism manifests itself in another way. Um, in the inability to understand somebody, how somebody else sees the world, literally sees the world. And Piaget studies this by putting a child in front of a display of three mountains, and he puts a doll on the other side, and the poor child's task is to show by either drawing, by selecting pictures, or by arranging the mountains in another display, how the mountains look to the doll who's looking at it from another perspective. And four-year-olds, do not understand that somebody will see this display in a different way from the way they see it. So what I see is what you see. No, no differentiation of perspectives. And also in middle childhood, in early childhood, we have egocentrism in language. Piaget wrote about this in The Language and Thought of a Child. And he wrote about the problem of collective monologues. Um, Language is not always dialogue, unlike what I heard Levinas saying, that language is always dialogue. Here we have, in early childhood, instead of dialogue, we have collective monologues, where two children are talking right past each other. And they, they are not bothered by the fact that the other doesn't understand, because they can't even conceptualize that the other doesn't understand, because they assume that what's in their mind is in your mind. And so we have no real true communication, <clears throat> no recognition of the other's point of view, and no recognition that the other is not understanding. And I want to give you an example of one of these collective monologues. <clears throat> there are two children, J and C. So J says, they wiggle when they kiss. What? My bunny slippers, they're brown and red and wiggle when they kiss. I have some sugar, I'm going to eat it, or maybe it's for a horse. My grandparents brought them for me, bought them for me. Again, going back to the slippers. You can't eat the sugar unless you take the paper off. Then we found some other slippers. Do you like sugar? I like to play with my bunnies. Now there, there's a little communication. I guess I'll eat my sugar at lunch. I can get more for the horses. And besides, I don't have a horse. So that's a beautiful example of not caring that the other doesn't understand, because you assume that what's in your mind is in their mind. Another thing you will see at this age is the way kids play hide and seek. You may have seen this. A three-year-old playing hide and seek will just cover up her eyes. And she will assume that if she can't see, you can't see. And therefore, she's hidden. That's egocentrism. <clears throat> the assumption that the other knows what's in your mind, no conscious awareness of the other's mind, and not asking themselves the question of whether the other understands. Piaget says, the child never thinks to ask the question of whether the other understands. <clears throat> so for the child at this age, the conception, Piaget's conception of the child at this age is that this is a, 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 an organism that has thoughts and feelings and perceptions, but it, this child is not aware of these things. He's not aware of thinking. He's thinking, but he's not aware of thinking. And therefore, there's no awareness of what others are thinking. Then comes adolescence. We've skipped middle childhood because there's no special form of egocentrism in middle childhood. And e in, in adolescence, there's another form of egocentrism. Um, and I have a picture of Mao here for a reason, because adolescents are revolutionaries. And Piaget said that this is because adolescents are extremely idealistic, and they believe that their thought has the power to change the world, that just by thinking, they can change the world. And that's a form of egocentrism, because they believe that their thought is so powerful that it can change the world. Of course, in Mao's case, it really did exert some rather important changes. 
Okay, so that's Piaget on self versus other. Um, since Piaget, there's been a huge amount of research in developmental psychology on something called theory of mind, which is actually very connected to egocentrism. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to talk a bit about that. It was all started by somebody named Joseph Perner, and uh, he doesn't actually say that he's talking about the same thing as egocentrism when he talks about theory of mind, but I think it's very, very connected. Having a theory of mind means understanding that you can predict and explain other people's behavior by figuring out what they believe. And the critical test for developmental psychologists of having a theory of mind is the ability to predict somebody's behavior based on a behavior that, uh, a belief that you know to be false. So here's how it's done. And by the way, I'm going to show you two false belief tasks. Three-year-olds always fail these. Four-year-olds always pass them. Autistic children always fail them. Here's the, here's the Sally Ann task. So up here, the child sees this um, little doll here, and, and I'll just run through it. This is Sally. This is Ann. Sally puts her ball in the basket. Sally goes away. Ann moves the ball to her box. When Sally comes back in, where will Sally look for her ball? Now, what's the right answer? The basket, right, because Sally was away. So how in the world would Sally know that it was here? But three-year-olds all very happily say, well, she'll look here, because that's where they know it is. And so they can't, they can't understand that somebody else could have a different belief. And here's another way the task is done. This is called the unexpected contents task, and it was done first in England. And so that's why I have a Smarties box up here, which is English M&Ms. Basically, you show kids a Smarties box, and you shake it around a little. It makes a noise, and you say, what do you think's in there? And they say candies or Smarties. And then you say, well, let's look inside. And you open it up, and you dump it out, and there are pencils inside. And you say, oh, my goodness, there are pencils inside. Isn't this amazing? And the kids laugh, and they think this is a riot. And then you put it back in the Smarties box, and then you say, let's invite Johnny into the room. When Johnny comes in, what is he going to think is in this box? And three-year-olds all very happily say, pencils. <laughs> and four-year-olds know to say Smarties. And autistic kids fail. So what leads to this failure is an inability to grasp that beliefs are just representations of the world and therefore they can be false. And also the assumption that my belief and your, that whatever I believe, you believe. And this is considered a genuine conceptual deficit. It's interesting that representing a conflict between my belief and your belief for a child is actually more difficult than representing a conflict between what I like and what you like. And here's how that's shown. Goldfish and broccoli. We all know that kids prefer goldfish to broccoli. And we ascertain that by giving kids a choice. And yes, they go for the goldfish. <laughs> and then the adult comes in and very enthusiastically eats the broccoli and very unenthusiastically eats the goldfish saying, yuck making it clear that her preference is different from the child's preference. And then the child is asked to give the adult some food, and at 14 months, the child gives the goldfish, which is what the child likes, but by 18 months, they understand to give broccoli. So they understand this long before they can understand that they can have beliefs different from somebody else's belief. They can understand the, the diversions of the desires before beliefs. Okay. Um, a little bit about the role of understanding other minds in communication, <clears throat> and this relates to the chapter on metaphor and irony. I think there's a special role of understanding other minds when speakers don't say what they mean. And we often don't say what we mean. And one way in which we don't say what we mean is when we speak ironically, which is in a very, very common form of speech, kidding around. Here's an example. Your study looks so neat. Okay, is this, what do I mean? I'm not saying what I mean. What I really mean is your study is messy and I'm making a joke out of it. But I could be making a white lie. I could be trying to make the person feel better. Or if somebody's playing the violin really terribly, I could say, that sounded really great. But maybe I'm trying to make the person feel better or maybe I'm actually trying to criticize them. To understand irony, you need to have a theory of mind because you have to enter into the speaker's state of mind and grasp the speaker's beliefs and the speaker's intentions. 
You have to be able to grasp that the speaker doesn't believe what is said and doesn't intend for you to take him literally and therefore is not uttering a white lie. But kids have a lot of trouble with irony until age six. So if you give them this, they will either say, well, I guess it is neat, and they will deny the evidence of their senses, or they will say the person is mistaken, the person didn't see right, but most typically they'll say it's a white lie. They don't know that term, but they'll say he's trying to make him feel better. Doesn't want to make him feel bad for having such a messy room. And you don't find understanding of irony saying, oh, he doesn't really mean it, he's kidding, or he's trying to make the person feel bad until age six. When we know that children can understand what's called second order <clears throat> mental states, my thinking about your thinking, or the speaker's intention about <clears throat> what he wants the listener to believe. And in an ironic speaker, the speaker's intention is to make you believe that your room is really a mess. So <clears throat> that's an example of how understanding other minds, failure to understand other minds, can lead to miscommunication. Empathy, how learnable? Okay, empathy is not the same as understanding other minds. Theory of mind and empathy diverge. You can understand somebody else's state of being and you can feel their pain and those are not the same. A psychopath is probably excellent at understanding because he can manipulate but may not have any empathy. My, goal, my uh, graduate student Talia Goldstein has been looking at whether theater trains empathy. You've probably all heard the claim, you may have heard the claim that studying theater makes people more empathetic. And when people make those claims, they're usually talking about arts education in schools. They're not thinking about Hollywood actors who we all know are not at all empathetic. Um, but Talia has been studying whether, in fact, the constant practice of taking somebody else's perspective when you become another character actually makes you more empathetic. And she has some really nice, beautiful evidence that it does. Um, actually, we don't know if it's causal or whether it's self-selection, but she has shown that kids who have theater training when they watch a sad movie, they tell you what the character feels and they tell you what they feel at the same time and they match the emotion. Whereas people who do not have theater training are much less accurate at feeling themselves what the character in the movie feels. We don't know whether it's the training from acting or whether it's the kind of person who goes into acting to begin with and that's why we're right now doing a longitudinal quasi-experimental study to try to sort that out. Art by the Outsider, Angelina Hawley. Um, she's looking at whether outsider status affects our aesthetic judgment. Okay, which one do you think is better? Anybody want to take a, just a, just automatic, you know, really quick. Which one do you like better? The one on the right? Anybody like the one on, anybody like one better? Okay. Now, would this affect your judgment? <laughs> I don't know the answer to this because we're just starting the study. <laughs> what about these two? Which one do you like better? <laughs> How many people like one better? How many people like two better? This means Angelina's picked really good pairs because we have people on either side, even though more people like one, and yes, <laughs> you're correct. That's by Hans Hoffman. Okay. So. Final piece of research from my lab is who is the other in today's digital world? Is it machines, like humanoid robots? Or is it non-human animals? So Karen Walker is giving young children and older children and adults and eventually computer scientists a task where they have a picture of a person and then they are asked which of these other two things is most like this person? And they're given choices like this. They're told that this is a robot that can do lots of things that people do, and this is a beetle. And what she finds is that children, both six and seven year olds and nine and 11 year olds, match the human with the robot rather than the beetle because it looks so much like a human. So they go for the externals. They're not giving a biological essentialism answer. Whereas adults are going for the beetle, but one of the things we're interested in finding out is whether computer scientists are gonna be actually um, more like the six-year-olds, but for different reasons. Because if you listen to people like Ray Kurzweil, he thinks there's not gonna be any difference between human and machine. And uh, it really doesn't matter what the substance of thinking is, it just matters that the computer can think. And the computer can obviously think much more than the beetle. Okay, finally, 
There's been a lot of interesting research on prejudice and stereotyping, and it's been shown that even by five months, this has set in. Um, Liz Felke, who's, who's at Harvard, a developmental psychologist, has shown that five-month-olds prefer speakers of their own language to speakers of another language. And remember, they can't understand language yet, but they will prefer speakers who sound familiar to them. And it's even the same finding for dialects. They prefer people who speak in their own dialect versus other dialects. 12-month-olds, one-year-olds, distrust new people who are not like them. Again, from Spelke's lab. She exposes kids to two strangers. One stranger speaks their parents' language. One speaks a foreign language. And then children are offered food by both of them. And which one do they go for? They go for the food that's offered by the person who speaks their parents' language. And they're stereotyping by at least three years of age. It was a study by Mazarin Banaji <coughs> and her graduate student Yarrow at Harvard. Um, they took 145 Caucasian children from age 3 to 13. They showed them pictures of racially ambiguous angry faces. They found that they were more likely to classify the race as black when the expression was angry rather than happy, showing that stereotyping has set in at least by age 3. And then there's this thing called the implicit association test, which has been developed and used extensively by Mazarin Banaji, who's a social psychologist at Harvard. And some of you, I don't know, has anybody ever taken this test? Okay. Um, you can do it with gender, you can do it with race, you can do it with age versus young. And, and here's how it works. You have to, you sit at a computer and you're told, I want you to press key, the K key when you see a black face or a word that's positive, and press the D key when you see a white face or a word that's negative. And there are lots and lots of trials of this and they test your, they measure your reaction time. Or, you, it's the reverse. Press the K key when you see a black face or a word that's negative. Press the D key when you see a white face or a word that's positive. Well, it turns out that people press the, um, the keys faster when they have to go for either white or good or black or bad. But when they feel there's an inconsistency there, it slows them up a tiny little bit. And they're not conscious of this. And this is considered implicit, unconscious racism. And you can show this for all kinds of things, gender effects, ageism, et cetera. It's pretty robust. So, um, and oh, my final point is that six-year-olds, 10-year-olds, and adults who are Caucasians, they're, as you, if you look at them as they get older, they're less likely to say, I prefer white faces, but all ages, all, Six-year-olds, just like adults, show the same level of automatic preference for their in-group on the implicit association test. So, to stitch this all together, the ability to distinguish self from other and to read the other's mind is species-specific. Chimps cannot grasp false belief. I didn't have time to show you all those studies. This ability, the ability to understand other people's false beliefs, is absent in atypical children, autistic children. It emerges gradually. You see it in four-year-olds, but not three-year-olds. It enables non-literal communication, particularly the ability to distinguish lying from, deceit, from irony. Understanding other minds is not the same as empathy. An outsider status may affect even our aesthetic judgment. And a preference for our own kind develops in infancy. But final point, the power of culture. Culture is shifting what we see as the other. The robots are not so other anymore because we're now living in a completely different digital world. And I think also culture shapes how our early preference for our own kind develops. That can develop in a malignant way or it cannot develop in a malignant way depending on whether we live in a racist culture. So even though we start out with these stereotypes, culture obviously has a very powerful role to play in determining how these early stereotypes develop and how they shape our behavior. Thanks. <laughs>